Nii, tere peale õnnad minu poolt, et see kord selline unikaalne võimalus rääkida ekraaniga, aga ma loodan, et me ta... Okay, my mistake, I was supposed to speak in English, so I'll switch to English. So, good afternoon from me. I will be talking about red teaming once again. And I usually collect the, the usual fan club, so I hope you're all there. Hello to everyone. And uh, I will talk about uh, red teaming and uh, purple teaming today. Uh, and variations of, of it. For some reason, I don't see any of my slides coming up. Okay, here we go. So, uh, previously I've talked in length about uh, red teaming uh, and I haven't touched on purple teaming. I want to elaborate on that a little bit. But uh, the theme of uh, this year's uh, event, uh, Reality Check, actually is very fitting to red teaming because the best uh, reality check of uh, organization's information security actually is red teaming and I will try to slice various angles of it. So, uh, this is a slide that many of you have seen. These are the things that uh, we do at Clarified Security. So we do a lot of pen testing, manual pen testing only. Uh, and then we do uh, a lot of red teaming. We like to do it on production, a real thing. And uh, then we have a lot of courses to uh, train the techies. And we've done a lot of exercises for uh, many years now. Uh, we've done LockShield since 2010. And it keeps growing bigger and fancier and more complicated. And then we have uh, our own exercise series, Cyber Range exercise. We've been doing it since 2015 and do up to five of them every year. And we also participate in NATO Cyber uh, Coalition, where we provide forensic scenarios so a lot of these very technical activities, but uh, of course the focus of today's uh, topic is red teaming and then some introduction to the terms. So red team is a hopefully independent group. Uh, sometimes it can be part of an organization, but usually it's out from outside to have a fresh look. And it plays the attacker, essentially. And uh, one of the things that every uh, serious company uh, that has something to lose should be doing nowadays uh, is threat hunting. So it's proactively looking for attack indicators uh, uh, to catch them uh, as soon as possible, of course. And uh, you always have to assess yourself from a perspective if you are an attractive target and to whom and why and what you can do about it. So, at Clarified Security, we preach uh, crawl, walk, run concept. Uh, nothing in new, new in that, but in context of exercise and red teaming, we consider production red teaming or purple teaming to be the pinnacle of uh, kind of uh, uh, security verification uh, assessment. But it all starts from individual skills. And oftentimes our customers, especially governments and military to whom we do uh, cyber exercises, the cyber range exercise, for example, they uh, tend to always want to go straight away to the exercise. And um, later on they come back that, oops, we, uh, we do believe that we should have done some training before that as well. So it all starts from uh, Individual uh, training, usually we proceed exercises with uh, hands-on hacking essentials course to have uh, attacker TTPs, the uh, tactics, techniques and procedures. Uh, and then also Hunt a Hacker is a good course to get them on the hunting capabilities, uh, how to uh, find us if we are attackers. And there's also on hands on hacking advanced for a more um, uh, kind of a TTPs that we do ourselves in red teaming. Uh, for example, Cobalt Strike uh, usage uh, that we tend to use quite a bit. Uh, and then there are cyber exercises, but we feel that uh, with exercises you have fake environments, you have somewhat fake rules, and it takes a lot of 
effort to set it up. So it's good for cooperation, for example, if the same industry wants to cooperate and, you know, uh, they have to have a common playground, or it's a military or it's a government. However, for everyone's use, red teaming is the best way to uh, go about uh, assessing the whole organization. So this pyramid kind of shows that vulnerability assessment uh, in terms of depth and breadth uh, can cover a lot. You can scan the whole environment and find a bunch of issues and that's that. But uh, with, for example, manual penetration testing that we do, you can do focus more on a smaller piece and go very deep. However, with red teaming you can go extremely deep with uh, actual uh, the whole organization and all aspects of its security because organization is only as strong as uh, its uh, weakest links. And here on this slide I've explained kind of a relationship what we have with a blue team and with a white team. So actually in red teaming uh, we don't talk to the blue team directly. They feel the impact of what we do, hopefully, uh, but then we always have to go through a white team, which kind of gives us the guidance, uh, also agreement of what our objectives are as a red team. Uh, however, uh, uh, basically from terms of red team and blue team, we're opposing to each other. We have to be sneaky and blue team has to keep us out and kick us out. So in that terms, the information sharing comes after engagement. Uh, and uh, red team has to be very sneaky in order to achieve objectives so we do our information collection, we do our initial compromise uh, moving around laterally, we have to be very sneaky about it and uh, the blue team sometimes doesn't see it at all or they see these uh, uh, TTPs that we emulate or use However, we, uh, we don't necessarily tie into who we are as threat actors because in many cases our uh, customers, blue teams, they don't know it's a red teaming exercise. They think it's a real thing. So that's why red teaming is very realistic, especially to the blue teams, because they think these are real attackers. They're coming after the company's assets uh, and people and data. Uh, and white team um, can also play, play it very differently. They can uh, get input both from uh, the blue side and red side, but often they want to kind of only know about things when the blue team informs them. Uh, of course, in situations where things can get out of control very easily, then usually red team provides them a lot of information what we're about to do or what we just did, and then we can wait to see if blue team reacts. So, but in any case, the slide shows that we're two separate players and we don't talk to each other during the game, exercise, real life, whatever you call it. But purple team kind of gets rid of the white team and then the red, blue actually talk to directly each other and the whole point is that you can test and improve detection and defense mechanisms very quickly in many areas, not just one path to victory that the red team found, but basically we can uh, go through many uh, different parts uh, together with the uh, blue team and talk to each other. Okay, we figured this out, now you cannot bypass our antivirus so easily, you can not sneak past our uh, uh, detection mechanism. So. Uh, uh, that makes uh, this purple teaming collaboration uh, very good. However, it takes away the whole surprise moment. Now, one thing to approach the whole red-blue teaming thing is to look at the Mitra attack framework. It's a very good thing that has evolved for uh, quite a long time now. And basically, it's a place where we can look at uh, how a real bad guys uh, operate. And Mitra has spent a lot of time analyzing this and uh, the whole acronym ATT&CK comes from adversarial tactics techniques and it as being a common knowledge. So uh, 
uh, and they say that this is based on real-life observations and we have mapped 107 different groups, uh, often state actors, but not only, uh, and you can follow a link to learn about it more. But uh, it's, it's quite uh, eye-opening to look at how the real bad guys operate. So this is just one slide of uh, Mitra attack roadmap of 2020. October and they highlight two uh, APT groups, state actors. So these are, uh, bluntly put, these APT 28 is Russian intelligence services, uh, at least the attribution, and then APT 29 uh, is uh, Russian government attribution. Uh, so you've heard terms like uh, fancy bear, well, and the, uh, which is APT28, and APT29 uh, as also one of the names uh, alleges to the, alludes to the bear something. Uh, kind of makes sense. But on this map, you can see that from the 12 categories of uh, uh, enterprise attack uh, tactics, uh, you can see what APT28 does, and I'll explain these details more, but just a big visual overview, you can see that, hey, these are the things that APT28 commonly does, the blue boxes, uh, and uh, what uh, is unique to APT29, and then the green uh, boxes are the things that they both tend to do. Actually, there's very little overlap on, on uh, what we do similarly. However, there is 107 different groupings analyzed and categorized, so actually when we do our red teaming and uh, some uh, annoying customer has taken their carbon black and has uh, Mitra Tech uh, kind of categorization and other feeds tied in, they actually will get alerts on these specific categories when we do our initial compromises, we do our privilege escalations, etc. So, but let's move on. So, actually, Mitra says that, hey, if you want to do red teaming, you can take our attack uh, kind of uh, 12 categories of tactics, and you can emulate uh, specific threat actors. Well, it doesn't necessarily need to be very specific grouping copying. The kind of common uh, techniques are all the same, so, but you can see that this is a sample kind of attack like uh, how it's going to play out, what other techniques are used. And uh, sometimes if you want to go in-depth with a customer, you can go through these tactics and specific techniques, which are under these 12 tactics, and discuss, okay, uh, the customer feels that we want to specifically test uh, lateral movement a lot. It means that maybe initial compromise is not so important. They may even agree that, hey, let's skip the whole initial compromise. Let's go to assume breach or assisted breach. Uh, but this is how it plays out. Let's go back to how I kind of explain it a little bit better, easier to our customers. What you as an adversary need to know. Uh, so, first of all, here's our target, uh, a uh, customer network, internal organization, and this is our target because they are our red team customer, or if we're criminals, then hey, we want to compromise these companies for profit or uh, for stealing data, whatever the actual intent may be. In order to get foothold in this organization, you need to collect quite a lot of information. And some of the key things are highlighted there the, with bigger and bolder print. You definitely need to know what kind of operating systems you're likely to come across. And even better, during your preparation work, you will map specific users, what kind of uh, operating systems and devices they are using to read email, uh, to work on documents, is it Windows 10 and uh, let's say uh, Apple phone, or uh, are you likely to come across uh, uh, Mac uh, computer? So you need to know where you're going to land with your malware even before you start um, compiling your specific malware to evade all these uh, 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 devices and uh, systems that are thrown at you and what operating system 
uh, and, and against what antivirus you're going to land. Of course, it's useful, especially if you do phishing, then you need to know also what kind of email client you're using, what browsers. If you want to use Office documents or PDF documents, you may want to know these flavors as well. And somehow you need to figure it all out. For later on, you also may be interested in what kind of multi-factor, or if any, they are using. Are we using it everywhere? Do they have a, a VPN uh, ingress points? What they are? Maybe you want to set up a fake one and collect credentials this way. Uh, so, and definitely, you kind of want to know how strong OPSEC the customer has. So, do they have monitoring? Do they have threat hunting process and capabilities? How good they are with incident processes? Because if they can detect you, but they cannot kick you out quickly, then you know how much time you have to dwell inside the organization. So, with all this information the, uh, that you need to prepare before you actually launch your exercise, uh, your attacks, uh, you assess the whole organization, see what are the weak points, and then you pick the path of least resistance to get to your objectives, called crown jewels in, in our case. Um, and these objectives are usually predefined with a white team of a customer. So if we jump back to the Mitra uh, attack uh, kind of views, there's a already introduced enterprise attack tactics with 12 categories, starting with initial access and with uh, ending with exfiltration or impact. But then Mitra also highlights there are 15 pre-attack tactics that attackers have to cover. And uh, this attack king uh, term I just coined myself, but you can see that there's a lot to do before you can get any foothold in an organization. So if you're a criminal, if you're a state actor, you probably have to prioritize and define your uh, targets, how do you select them, uh, what's higher priority, yada, yada. Well, with red teaming, it depends on a customer. Yeah, it, the, the first three uh, points are easier. But then you need to do your information gathering, technical, people, organizational. And then you have to look at the technical and people weaknesses, organizational weaknesses. The weakness could be that the organization needs to interact with so many uh, entities, be it uh, supply chain or it be it customers, other business-to-business -business, uh, relationships. So you have to analyze all of this. And one thing, this whole picture is actually laid out also from the perspective that in Mitra analysis, this comes after the, the defenders figure these things out later. So if you look at, for example, adversary OPSEC, these are things that you can learn later. Oh, attacker made a mistake here, or they keep reusing the same kind of tactics. So, okay, I can match that this company, this entity was attacked by the same organization because we use same tactics, same tools, same procedures. So in terms of Red teamers, uh, you also have to think of your OPSEC, and we have to admit that we've screwed it up uh, every once in a while as well. So I'll show you an attack campaign outline of what we did uh, later last year, second half of the year. We attacked uh, five different entities at the same time, and we did a couple of operational security mistakes there. We left our infrastructure up a little bit long. We made some mistakes in our... Uh, uh, malware testing, uh, some of the staging issues, especially with uh, SSL certificates uh, that can give information away. Long story short, some company doing analysis of a darknet wrote uh, an APT report about us and uh, thought that we're new state actors. So uh, we did not get APT or grouping number assigned to us, but uh, we came close. So luckily they contacted uh, someone that contacted us and uh, cleared out the situation that this was legitimate red teaming. But you have to think of these pre-attacks and that it takes a lot more effort than the time inside the organization and the latter can happen very fast. So let's go to it. Uh, before I get to the actually describing the timeline of uh, red teaming, um, 
the effort usually is between three to six man weeks and the more sneaky, the more information we have to gather, our, gather ourselves, the more time we need for that as an attackers. Uh, not just the time that we actually spend working, but time in terms of if we make a mistake, we need to let the customer quiet down so that they're not alert anymore. So in uh, like this zero knowledge position case, uh, pen, uh, the red teaming engagement can be uh, about half a year long. Sometimes shorter, but you need to have this buffer time if you make uh, a mistake or you need to stay low for a while. And red teaming is always objective driven, so this you agree up front, or if the customer cannot provide the objective, you say, hey, I'll be an opportunistic attacker, I'll get in and I'll figure out what's juicy and interesting myself. That's also fine. And the first time around, usually there's minimum knowledge so you can assess how your organization reacts, how your defenders react, and there's a lot of learning of capabilities this way. So it's a surprise to red team, it's a surprise to, in terms of red team, it's a surprise what you're gonna encounter, not who you're gonna attack, but to blue team that it's a red team at all, it can be a surprise and it's a good thing if it's a surprise. Of course, if you already repeat this engagement, then the surprise moment is a little bit lost. All of this happens on production environments, live, and, uh, live environment, and there's very uh, uh, few restrictions, hopefully, because bad guys also can use social engineering, they can use phishing, they can drop USB sticks, uh, all kinds of things uh, that uh, creative people can come up with. And like I said, the engagement period should be reasonably long. So from zero knowledge engagement point of view, uh, one example of timeline. So this loosely uh, kind of reflects on, on attack campaigns that we did against five organizations, most of them government organizations, uh, last year, second half of the year. So we got them lined up around July, August, pretty much all of them. That's when we started doing our homework and that's where my kind of pipeline said that, hey, we have to fo attack five organizations in the same, same time period. So, and uh, they all were related to Estonia one way or another. So some were Estonian government organizations, some were companies in Estonia. So we actually came up with uh, some vulnerabilities in uh, TigiDoc applications and decided to use that. But because we knew that this vulnerability we could use only once and then it's burnt, it meant that we wanted to do the pre-attack phase against all these organizations, perfect for each organization to know their choice of antiviruses, operating systems that we come across, validate their email addresses, hopefully validate what kind of operating system specific users are using, et cetera, et cetera so that we could craft malware that will ghost all those uh, target organizations' defenses. Uh, so after doing our like intelligence gathering homework, we uh, fired off the first wave of pre-phishing. And basically what we did, uh, we sent away uh, some Atlassian product something something newsletter, uh, pretty much exactly copy-paste of a real newsletter what we got ourselves and sent it to uh, quite a lot of people in all those organizations. Nothing malicious in it at all. The only thing we wanted to know is if we have valid email accounts. So basically we had come up with email lists for all these uh, organizations, people, what roles they worked in, and we wanted to make sure that they're still working there uh, and, uh, you know, if as a bonus we can also get the information what they used to read this email, uh, uh, what operating systems, then this is useful as well. But totally benign thing, most of organizations never even suspected that it's something malicious. But it's very important to get your target list sorted well and get some additional information. Then you need to start filling other gaps. So, uh, uh, to lure the users to click on some links. Maybe this already happened in a previous fish, but definitely something to send out the links to, uh, to get people clicking on something. This way you detect your operating system, your, uh, 
uh, email clients, uh, web browser choices, uh, so you get more information this way. Also nowadays one of the problems is that a lot of people tend to read their emails, at least the first look, via the phone. And therefore we had to uh, kind of uh, persuade them that uh, you can get more when you uh, actually go and visit the site with, uh, with a PC, uh, with a browser. So you can throw out messages like, okay, this website is not optimized for a mobile phone experience, please uh, visit this link from the desktop. So another way to get info. And sometimes to get the final bits of information that you just cannot get uh, via these somewhat passive techniques is that you simply ask. So we actually sent out another prefish with questionnaire asking, hey, we're conducting a cybersecurity survey. Have you had a recent uh, training in cybersecurity? Uh, some benign, stupid questions and then straight to the point. So at uh, your workplace, what kind of oper operating systems do you use? What kind of web browsers do you use on a regular basis? Do you know what antivirus do you have on your computer? So, and usually would get all the honest answers and boom, against five organizations, you have most of the picture of what you're gonna hit when you deliver your malware and what to evade in terms of various antiviruses because it's very easy to evade specific antivirus or small list of antiviruses if you know what they are, but random one may be uh, almost impossible. So, uh, and you can see actually that uh, once you get uh, successful phishing gone out in November and the scales are actually there are quite different, uh, you can see that uh, from there it can take a week or two to get the whole thing done. So actually out of five organizations, only in one organization we did not get foothold. And in one of them where we got the foothold uh, but didn't have time to look around too much, we, and the deadline was actually in somewhere in February, we said, okay, we got enough, we stay low for a month and deal with our customers. So the attackers may do the same. Now, pre-existing knowledge to shorten the timeline. For example, I have customers saying that, hey, we want to do the red teaming this year and it's already October. So then we say, okay, we uh, don't have time to be sneaky and make mistakes, so uh, you have to assist us. So please, white card, give us some information about your environment as a white team so we can skip a lot of our open source intelligence. And then we may still want to do some pre-phishing because, for example, we don't, and even the white team cannot tell us what are the preferred browsers and uh, devices that the user is using. Uh, to read the email. So we refine our information with some pre-phishing maybe and then the real thing hits off and the same thing repeats. The attack phase may actually take just a few days, few weeks. Uh, or if you're not happy again, you got kicked out uh, in this time frame, uh, then you can take a break and come back later. But you can see how this pre-attack phase shortens a lot. And we just recently did uh, another pre-existing knowledge against an uh, impressively well-defended bank where we uh, actually upfront said that, hey, we want to use insider assist to learn the specific defense mechanisms. And they had Microsoft ATA, Microsoft ATP, and as a prize, they had Carbon Black with lots of good feeds in it. So they were detecting us left and, light, uh, left and right but we got a lot of technical information from this insider assistance and also some white carding. And you can see that the pre-attack phase continued as we learned, but we moved the attack phase very quickly and we fired away our uh, phishing or watering hole attacks and we actually dropped uh, 10 USB sticks as well. Uh, and there was one surprise department that actually stuck it in their computer and infected. Uh, so uh, um, you can shorten the whole engagement a lot and still get a lot of value out of it. So I have five minutes left. Let's wrap it up. Uh, with uh, red teaming, the benefits are that it can be highly realistic. If a blue team has no clue that this is an exercise, a red teaming exercise, it can be ultra, ultra realistic. 
uh, to them. However, they don't learn about it until they get the report or the exercise is over at least. So there's not much information sharing going on. And the red team has internal, while the whole point is to help the organization and to teach the blue team, in order to achieve objectives, we need to be sneaky, we need to be stealthy. So we cannot share all the time. Yes, the white team can get some information, but because there's so much going on, even the white team doesn't have a full picture of what's going on. Uh, and red teaming can cover some opportune paths to achieve objectives, but we, don't, we, we are objective driven. We cannot test everything because this gives away us as attackers. Now, if you go to purple teaming, the Big benefit is that there's a lot of information sharing between blue and red all the time. Both sides learn a lot. Also an added benefit can be that it spares the users because we don't need to fish them, we don't need to attack them, but it comes down to techie level work and the rest of the organization is left out. So yes, we can test a lot of TTPs in a shorter time, but it's a different thing. Uh, sometimes it's good, I've highlighted, for example, you can do after red teaming engagement to improve all the gaps that you had in your defense and detection, or before you, if you're buying some very magic solution and vendor has oversold it to you and then you actually want to know if it works, then purple teaming is good as well. But then to go back and see if organization as such is well protected as uh, the whole thing, then red teaming is a much better approach to that just to explain the differences to you. Uh, because business people like Magic Quadrants, I've thrown this there, I've shown this in previous years as well, nothing has changed. Red teaming is very realistic. It is not as efficient as purple teaming in terms of covering a lot of different TTPs and a lot of uh, defense methods, but it definitely uh, goes deep. And with most red teamings, they try to get their uh, uh, compromise done, objectives done, and then if they're uh, done with their objectives, they can go towards hacking to get caught. So become noisier, you make intentional mistakes to give a blue team a chance to catch you and learn through that. Uh, so hopefully this highlights and explains what the various uh, blue and red teaming and uh, purple teaming can do for you. So why? It's your organization that plays it, it's your staff gets their experience with their daily tools and daily roles. Yes, red teaming will take definitely them out of comfort zone, but it's their daily life that they're protecting. And uh, the unique benefit is that you compare, can compare the notes with your adversary, the red team or purple team continuously, and red team helps you to raise the bar in uh, this activity. And uh, last year I told you about 50 shades of red teaming, so by bringing in the purple it turns out there's even more than 50 shades. But one of the arguments is uh, often that the red teaming is for very important and very matured security terms uh, organizations. No, sometimes it's perfect if the organization takes a red teaming first time and gets totally their asses kicked. It's fine because that's when management wakes up, that's when people realize that they have a problem, there's budget coming, there's uh, actually buy-in coming from upstairs, and you can start actually doing defense a way that you have perhaps envisioned or don't even know that you need yet. So there's many ways to do it. I explained the timelines more uh, this time, and perhaps what the difference between purple and red is. But uh, we have customers that endlessly say that hey, we, we know we have these gaps and issues, we want to fix them first and then definitely we'll take a red team. They'll tell me about this for years. So it's sometimes better to get started sooner than later. Yeah, as deliverables, we give narrative style report, the path to victory. We give advice as an attackers, our perspective, some cleanup report to go back to what uh, things we left behind as surprises, perhaps. And uh, we give executive level summary, but one of the hits that we do as a bonus is that we go to the big audience, we go to end users and explain that when the stupid, annoying emails, phishing emails stopped, when uh, on the annoying things that you saw stopped, we were in your computers doing fancy things, and here's the results. So uh, this is at least one of the great benefits. And 
showed this last year as well. People think that uh, communication teamwork, working as a team, is the main benefit of red teaming, not just the technical part. And on both sides, we make mistakes and we improve. Uh, it's all yours and ours. And then the result is that we have something holistic that has improves your security. So thank you very much. I'm out of time. And I'll see you next year or outside here in the uh, event location. Bye from me.